Hey everyone, it's Dylan Peckis, and we're going to talk about and show you just how Epstein-Barr virus, mono, glandular fever, whatever you want to call it, how it's causing, or maybe not causing, your fatigue at all. So stay tuned. Hey everyone, it is Dylan Peckis here, and I am excited for this one today, even feverish, and that was a really bad joke about glandular fever, mono, Epstein-Barr virus, whatever you want to call it. This is a really important topic because maybe I talked about one person per day who has a history of Epstein-Barr virus and that being a causal agent, perhaps, in what's been going on with their health fatigue and everything else for so long. And so in today's episode, we are going to talk about, all right, what are the truths around this? What are some of the myths around this? Being able to first clear out kind of the, the junky junk in terms of understanding, okay, how are we off on this issue? Because, you know, if this really were the issue here, no one should be experiencing issues with this 10, 20 years down the road probably should be able to figure it out by them. But we're going to show you exactly why a lot of those things don't work. And then we also want to dive into the truth as well, and then give you that big fundamental shift in understanding, okay, what are the key components I need to be addressing when I have a history of EBV? And that's what I'll say for the most part, because Epstein-Barr virus is just way too many syllables. We don't have time for that. So what we're going to first uh, start with is, you know, really making sure that who this is for. And this is for you if you have a history of this. Maybe you have a reactivation right now. You just had some, you know, IgG, IgM serum tests, or maybe you've just been told by a practitioner, functional medicine, naturopathic, even conventional, or maybe you have a sneaking suspicion that you have an issue with EBV, Epstein-Barr virus being a pivotal part in what's going on with your fatigue. But first, medical legal disclaimer, I should have a graphic for this. So it's more exciting. Everything in here is provided for informational purposes only. All right. Always, always speak to your licensed healthcare provider when making decisions around your health. Everything you do is at your own risk. All right, green light. Thank you, uh, judge, your honor. And so what we're going to jump into is we're going to I like to think of this like a garden here. We got to clear out a lot of the weeds. So let's bust some myths. All right, so we are going to dive into a lot of the myths around EBV as sort of this causal agent in what's going on with your fatigue. And I want to bust up the biggest one of them all first. And what is that? Well, that is... EBV, monoglandular fever, infection, or even reactivation here, which is probably the, the majority of people listening and watching this, it's not the root cause of your fatigue. Like not even a little bit, okay? And yes, I know that sounds very confounding because I too have had mono in the past, and then you're just plain out exhausted. Yes, you're going to have an acute reaction to this virus. That's just how that works. After that, okay, for the most part, I think it's about 85, 90% of people bounce back and they're good. And then 10% of those people with that initial Epstein-Barr virus EBV infection, then they'll stay in this lingering phase. If not immediately after the acute phase, it will then kick them in the butt somewhere down the road. And the statistics on this, remember, of all the people who get EBV, 10% of them, will have lingering EBV and also chronic fatigue here. And then when you think of all the people that complain or have, you know, diagnosed chronic fatigue here, whether it's chronic fatigue syndrome, whether it's your doctor just kind of scratching his head, like, I don't really know what's going on with you. 90% of those people will test positive for EBV. So, I mean, slam dunk, right? You got to have EBV and that's what's causing your fatigue. It's really, it's really not. Because as we'll get into a little bit later, this is just kind of the foundational piece here. But when we're talking about a virus, 
two things I want you to fundamentally understand. Get your pen or your, uh, I forget what it's called, the air pen for your iPad or whatever, and write this down. A virus, stick with me here, it will either be a uh, opportunistic infection of someone who has a weakened immune state anyway. That's thing one. And then thing two on top of that is when a virus reemerges, it's again because it's a weakening of the physiological integrity of that organism. All right. I know that's a lot to bring in there, but essentially if you're in a weakened state, either a virus is going to rear its ugly head. It's going to come out of hiding. Think of like shingles or herpes zoster, which either of those aren't really great for public relations um, or public relation information. But essentially, that will hang out in a part of your nervous system, the dorsal root ganglia in your spine here. And that's why when you see someone with shingles, it kind of comes out in this distribution of where it comes across one side of your body. It's itchy, it, heck, it hurts as all heck. And that's because it's in your nerve causing a lot of that pain. Where was it for all those years? It, it was a virus that you very, very likely had in childhood that showed itself in one way, and then you dealt with it, or so you thought. And then it lingered for years and years and years. And this is when I would press the sound effect button with kind of some suspenseful thing. And that's how viruses do their thing, okay? Because when we're looking at all your DNA, a good chunk of it, a very, very large portion of it is non-coding DNA or junk junk DNA. And what that means is that, you know, out of all, let's say your DNA in your the nucleus of your cell, it's like a book. Let's say there's 100 pages. One of those pages is what your cells are going to check to make its own, you know, proteins, all those other parts of your body and your cells. It's going to use one page and the other 99, it's not going to use. All right. I think non-coding DNA is more like 95%, but you get the point. There's a overwhelming amount of genetic information that you're not actually using. Where did that come from? Why do I have to make these weird hand movements? Those are predominantly from viruses. Dun, dun, dun. And so when you actually start to think about viruses as a part of who we already are, then it brings the question, okay, how are some of these infectious? And this isn't really across the board for everything, okay, but for this particular type of virus related to herpes especially, like Epstein-Barr, is they're kind of like cousins. That's how this organism or viral particle will work. It'll get in there, it'll hang out, and it'll wait for the conditions to be right, and then that's when it'll kind of come back and forth. So it's not really the EBV per se, it's the conditions in your body that will set it up. So that's like the, the key myth, like, you know, if you can literally find the neurons in your brain that had those ideas that, okay, you know, I need to address the EBV, I need to be on antivirals, I need to do this EBV cleanse, take those neurons out, okay? Now, don't go go get neurosurgery on me because that has its own issues, but you can just, you know, just take them right out and leave them to the side, and we're going to pluck out some other weeds here in your EBV understanding garden as we kind of get into things here. So, one of the big things as part of this is that when you're addressing EBV then, diet is kind of largely irrelevant. Now, it, whenever I mention diet being irrelevant, I am talking to people who are putting a lot of time and focus on their diet. Yes, if you're eating french fries and potato chips and cookies like all the time, yeah, that's going to have an effect. Why? High blood sugar levels that spike all the time, they're going to feed the virus in a way. You're eating a lot of things. Your insulin keeps going up as well. Insulin in people that don't have the best of health has a highly inflammatory response. It's going to have a growth response as well, freeing up fuel sources for things to grow like viruses and all that good stuff. So yes, there is a shade of truth to diet being relevant, but at a certain point, eating a perfect picture, perfect paleo diet, eating an awesome vegan diet, etc. Those are going to limit the damage at best. It's never going to be in a point of where it actually really allows the virus to sort of clear out. And what I mean by this is, and we can go to the whiteboard 
for this. Look at that, we're at the whiteboard here. And so with this, when we're talking about why is this virus gonna come out? Remember, think of the shingles example again. Why does it come out? Because it is able to sense when it's going it's I mean essentially it is like a uh, attack hound here. It's going to be able to tell when the energy in the system, we'll just put E for energy, or I'll just write it down to make it super clear. This is a signal for the virus to come out. Because think about it. It wants to attack and take over your body and be able to use it to replicate more things. Is it gonna do that when your body's producing a lot of energy all the time or it's when a lower amount? Obviously a lower amount of energy production is gonna signal that weakness in a way. So as that happens, this energy going down will lead to the one of two things I mentioned. Virus infection or two, virus reveal, which sounds kind of like, that sounds too nice, <laughs> but you get the idea. And then as you have these decreased bioenergetics, these are the two results that happen. And remember, when we're talking about how your body fundamentally produces energy here, it's just like your car. Okay, we'll clear this canvas off here because essentially food's gonna come in you can think of this as fuel here. It's gonna go into this black box of your metabolism and it's gonna come out the other side as energy. Okay. These engines, and the analogy here, this would be predominantly your mitochondria, this would be other pathways, glycolysis, all that other stuff. But the point being, if you're not able to turn that food or fuel into energy on the other side, it doesn't matter how much you snack, doesn't matter how much you eat, doesn't matter what kind or quality of the food that you're eating, to an extent, of course, it's never gonna be able to fundamentally address that energy issue, okay? It'll help a little bit, but you're missing a bigger part of it because you're not fundamentally repairing those metabolic machinery, and then your energy is gonna be low, and then it's just gonna take, you know, a tiny thing to reactivate some of these viruses, okay? you know. Think about shingles again. Or I mean, well, I mean, let's just think about EBV because it's the pretty much exact same mechanism. You have a little bit of a stressor in your life. You have, maybe you had a grueling workout. Maybe you were put onto night shifts or something like that. And then all of a sudden things really crash from there. And that's when either you're going back to how you were when you first had EBV, or this is a new level of where every single day it's just like you wake up and you're just like, like a train hit you. Like that morning is just like an absolute drag. You get a little bit of an uptick because either you reach for coffee or you're able to squeeze a little bit of energy out of your system here. And then the afternoon is now a crash and or a dip or a slump. And then eventually you're just at this very low lot, low level baseline of energy, not only because the underlying issue, the engine is not producing energy, but also the additional stress on your system of the virus there. Okay, so that's why when you're like, sometimes people are like, oh, eat this or that for Epstein-Barr virus, it's only gonna get you so far. And it'll only get you really stuck with this in managing things. And that's not what you want. You wanna be able to rise above, leave it behind, okay? You don't wanna walk around your life with a bunch of Band-Aids all over all your issues. You want them fixed and then be able to focus on the things that are fun, okay? So diet, somewhat irrelevant here. Other big myth is this concept of having to fight inflammation to get rid of Epstein-Barr virus. Again, some truth to this, because when there is a chronically high, massive amount of inflammation, yes, bringing that down is gonna help, but fully eradicating that signal is not gonna help because inflammation is not so straight as forward as your house is on fire or your house is not on fire. It's a little bit more of a complicated thing here. So let's go back to the whiteboard for a little bit. And what we want to understand is that inflammation, yes, we can think of it as a fire here, but it's really more of a signal. Okay. Inflammation is a signal in your body. All right. It's just like raising a flag at the start of a race it allows the cars to go off. 
etc. So you can think about like a time. Let's let's think of like street lights here, of where if you if that street light was constantly green, that's going to have its own issues. If it was constantly red, that would have its own issues. Everyone's going to be backed up and really pissed off. Same thing in your body. If inflammation is too high, issues. Too low, issues as well. But here's the thing. Your body needs the natural flow and inflammation levels going up and back down to be able to stimulate the processes that kick the, your viruses out, whether it's EBV, something else, or the other co-infections that you'll come and see in people like Lyme, Babesiosa, those sorts of things. Very similar principle. And so if you're just completely squashing inflammation, you completely lose the signal for healing here because inflammation is broken down into the acute sort of response and this will happen now the bad thing is this is where a lot of people stay stuck but then there should be a resolution phase and this is when things return to normal but the thing is people will stay stuck here and then they'll take on so many anti-inflammatories. They'll either do it through diets, supplements, medications, and then they'll prevent this resolution from ever happening, which is not really what you want there at all. You want to be able to have the natural mechanism in place so you can actually make those big shifts in where you want to go with that, right? And that's why a lot of people, they'll be on the anti-inflammatory supplements, and they'll just stay on them and don't really get anywhere. Like that's one of those supplements of where when you just have like turmeric and resveratrol just kind of on your shelf here, that's when those things just kind of stay and they become those supplements of you're really not sure. Is this doing anything? I don't know. Okay. And so with that kind of thing slowing down on the board here, let's just kind of cross out of there. All right, and so the other sort of big myth here is, yeah, so diet's not going to do a whole lot. Neither is sort of addressly, I mean, directly addressing inflammation. And the other thing, which is kind of just a dead end sort of cyclical habit, antivirals even. Because again, EBV coming out is a symptom. EBV being infecting you is a symptom. So if you're just taking antivirals, you know, this is the same thing as, you know, you having a headache all the time. So you start taking aspirin. But by the way, you're also banging your head against the wall every single morning. You know, it's it's not going to really allow you to fix those issues. And the, the real issue with this is now when you're at this level, this is when you're like really entrenched into the standard paradigm. Because very few people will actually throw antivirals at you. Because they don't really think it's an issue, but certain people do. And then that's when you're dealing with the side effects, which they have horrible side effects. And some of them are very potent. All the cyclovirs. And then you're also in this time trap of, okay, let's give this six months. Let's see how it does. Six months of stalling and just kind of, you know, taking aspirin when you still have this head banging process going on inside physiologically. That's not going to lead you anywhere good fast. Not at all. And so that's why you need to be able to see beyond these myths and be able to see to the fundamental level of what's really, truly going on. And that's where we're going to go next. That is what's really going on with EBV. All right. So with this component, we want to kind of just put it out there. And this is kind of building on the previous point here that is your body was already set up for disaster right not having that energy all on board there and that was then leading to this virus being able to take over or manifest again it is this key energy component of what's really going on at that level and so one of the big big concepts to get with the whole energy part here is that when you don't really have the energy on board, that's going to affect epigenetics. Okay, this is kind of the more technical spiel of what's going on for everyone. And epigenetics is essentially how your body is able to handle its genetic machinery based on the 
available energy. All right. So essentially what this means is the more energy you have in the system, the more epigenetic modifications that your body can have to thrive a lot better, to make things more efficient, to be in a place of where you're able to adapt to your environment, your stressors, your life as good as possible. All right. All these people who can like eat whatever the heck they want and they're absolutely fine. They'll put on a pound. They have awesome epigenetics. Their body can then just kind of deal with things on the sort of snap of a finger here and being able to be in that spot of where you know they get sick for a day they're fine or they can just pretty much do anything to their health and nothing seems to be breaking or rattling now of course there's a subset of people who they'll get theirs on the sort of tail end the chronic end but there are certain people who their body's ability to have this epigenetic expression in such an efficient manner is so good that they don't run into those issues because their body is highly adaptable and it's not because they got lucky they didn't win the genetic lottery they have that sort of infinite supply of energy into their body. All right, maybe not infinite. <laughs> okay, that's kind of way off there. But they have a higher sort of yield of energy, and they are also able to use it more efficiently. So what that means is, you know, think of a budget here. Say you have a, a monthly budget of 500 bucks versus a monthly budget of $2,000. Which one do you think it, like is going to be a scenario where you know, something hits the fan earlier, the, the $500 budget or like $2,000 monthly budget. Obviously the $500 budget, you know, because I'm not sure where you're living and that's able to kind of allow you to kind of get by here. And you haven't forbid an emergency comes up, you don't have anything to do for that. Same thing in your body. It's going to partition the energy to the most essential things first. Food, utilization, even going out and getting food, being able to have some level of function, being able to move ions back and forth across your membranes, all those things are like the essential, essential functions. And then it's not able to do the extra things here. And when it's not able to do the extra things, it's not able to fend off things like viruses once again. But the thing is, when, you're, when your body isn't using the epigenetic machinery, so to speak, something else is going to. And that's exactly what all viruses do. Because not only is it the low energy that signals to the virus, hey, it's a good time to strike, but also when you know the sort of epigenetics aren't being used as properly in terms of uh, just not being able to, they're not occupied. It's just kind of like sitting there and waiting for someone to use and the virus is gonna come in and do it. So one of the kind of fun things, kind of a, a fun comparison here, is when we think about sort of populations of people that get a reactivation of viruses, one of my favorite is astronauts. They're out of this world, in fact. And what actually happens there is that when we think about astronauts, when they're coming back, even if it's just like a few months, a year, their bodies are like literally falling apart. Their bone density goes to like advances to like a 60, 70 year old woman. They're pretty much gonna get cataracts when they're older. They're not fully able to walk, obviously because of a lack of a gravitational field and having to use the force of their muscles all the time. But the thing is, when they're up there, that is a very, very low energy sort of state. There's a lot of reasons. One, you're in this big metal tin. Two, you're surrounded by all this like sort of unnatural crap and you're out in space and you're just not really connected to a lot of natural energy flows. And then, you know, obviously the food's not gonna be optimal. It's just really things to help someone survive and press a bunch of buttons on a screen. That's really kind of the extent of it. Being in that sense, guess what really explodes in astronauts serums when they return? All these viruses, viruses will come out because it's in this highly susceptible environment. There's, they don't have a lot of energy in their body and viruses are gonna take over like that. And the, the really the, the mechanism of how that works, that's going to be in your immune system, your nervous system, and then the energy component again, but kind of coming back into the immune and the nervous system here. So we're going to touch on those things right here, right now. So with your immune system, because yes, there's the sort of the whole energy equation, but the other part is whenever we're talking about energy as a whole, you also want to be able to break it down to compartments you know, either all the way down to the mitochondria or entire systems, because that allows you to then play with the whole system here. And so with that, when we're thinking about, okay, the immune system, where does that rank in terms of mitochondrial density, energy usage? It's pretty high. 
you know, it's up there with your brain, your heart, etc. Because it sometimes has to be pulled into a lot of action very quickly here. And when you don't have the proper energy available, and when your immune system isn't able to communicate with each other properly, you're not able to then mount a proper immune response. Okay? And when that happens, essentially, you know, you can have Epstein-Barr particles flying around, and then, you know, certain cells from your immune system we don't need to get in t cells b cells but just know that you know when they interact there should be this immune reaction but there's not and this is a process known as energy it's like energy but with an a instead of that first e energy and essentially you have a non-reactive immune system just like when you're non-reactive it has something to do someone's like hey you want to go out and you know have this weekend camping trip and you're just like no oh. Or you make up some excuse or whatever. And you're in that state of energy, which is without energy, A, and we don't need to get into etymology. But with that, essentially, viral particles come in, immune system doesn't even, it doesn't even care. It doesn't have the energy to care. Okay, this is the cool part about looking at the micro and how it really corresponds to the, the whole microcosm of, of you here. And so as that's going on, it's not going to react. And even if it does react, it's not able to mount a, few, a full immune response. It just simply does not have the energy to carry all of that out. And when it doesn't, that's when the virus will win. That's when the virus will replicate because your body is just diverting all its energy just to breathing, senses, digestion, all those things. And immunity is like, okay, we can kind of put that on the back burner because we can handle this chronic virus to some extent as opposed to taking the gamble and the risk let's try to deal with this acutely but we may burn out the other systems so you'll cut out the immune system from the budget there and that's why so many people with fatigue they're sick all the time or they get a cold like every month they have all these co-infections and it's just something that keeps happening no matter how many supplements you're stacking on it because you're missing that sort of core component of having energy available and also the communication signals between your immune system because your immune system is just like every other sort of system in your body it needs to be able to coordinate itself properly and when you're someone who is in a low energy state you're not going to have that coordination either okay so that's the immune system there and then the thing that happens when your immune system is underactivated, viral load comes on either acutely but then chronically, ultimately, or reactivation, this is then going to embed into your nervous system, just like we were talking about with shingles. Also, what we were talking about with Epstein, Barr virus, and many other viruses. Why is that? Why, oh, why? Because your nervous system, especially in your central nervous system, in your brain here, is the term is immune, yeah, immunity privileged. Or just the immune system is not going to go in there and kind of survey things in your brain is one scenario. Ovaries and testicles are another, but that's not really the focus of today. But just know that you can have an infection in your brain. Your immune system is not going to be able to get to it because all those cells will have to go through your blood-brain barrier, and that's not so easy. That's why like infections in your brain are very, very serious. Not just because they're in their brain, but really naturally, you know, a brain infection is pretty much a terminal thing. Luckily, there is conventional medicine that is really, really good at those things. I know I beat up conventional medicine all the time, but they're good at some things, folks. These chronic things, less so. Acute things, yeah, sign me up. I break my arm. Knock on wood here. Uh, it doesn't happen. But essentially, being able to sort of when you have these viruses come on, now it's in your immune system. And it's just like if you were to put a bunch of crap in your living room and you still try to do all the things you want to do, you know, watch TV, uh, watch these, you know, these broadcasts, be able to, you know, do all the fun things that you want to do. But now it's a lot harder because you have like a bunch of stuff in the way. So you have to be working harder. You're in this overactivation mode. Same exact thing with your nervous system here. It's going to go into the state of overactivation I mean, I guess kind of similarly to you, when you're in this go, go, go mode, when you have this inertia, is it easier to keep going or is it easier to stop? 
Now, yes, eventually you're going to be forced to stop because you continue with that inertia. An object that is in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon a greater or equal force. All right. Thank you, Isaac Newton. And so with that, same thing with your nervous system. And particularly the circuitry in your sort of the middle of your brain here, that's the, the limbic system. And this is where all your emotions live, where you're going to be fighting, where you're going to be loving, where you're going to be, you know, even emotional eating, things of those nature. And that's why so many of those things kind of can really sort of gain a lot of momentum in you, especially like something like anxiety, for instance, you go down that anxiety down spiral, even depression here, very similar thing. Now, with the nervous system overactivation because of a virus, very similar concept. It's now going to start cranking your limbic system and it's going to keep going and going. And as you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. And what that means is essentially you've made that in a very efficient neural circuit that's going to be overactivated more frequently because neural circuits are basically essentially activated by electricity. All right. If you have a less efficient nervous pathway or neural pathway, say like, um, you know, cleaning your room or remembering to uh, send your mom a card every week. That's a pathway that, well, one, I have to start sending my mom a card every week. Hi, mom. But two, that's something that you don't commonly do. Okay. And then th compare it to brushing your teeth. I hope everyone here brushes their teeth. Anyway, so with that, it doesn't take a whole lot to activate this very efficient circuit here, whereas it takes a lot more electrical activity to activate this circuit. And yes, I know there's conscious, some conscious factors for those, but that's the essential premise. Now, when we're thinking about kicking your limbic system into overdrive, the amount of electrical activity needed each and every single day that you're having this virus present and causing stress, it's going to lower and lower and lower and lower and lower pretty much to the point where it's just actively on all the time and this is when what has seemed to be an Epstein-Barr virus problem is now becoming a big system problem your gut is becoming dysfunctional you have IBS you have to limit your foods your sleep is falling apart you either can't fall asleep or you're waking up like four or five times a night, and you just feel like a train wreck the next morning. Your muscles can't really sustain any physical activity. You have migraines because your neurovascular system cannot coordinate anything at all. All of these things will sort of pop off because when your limbic system is like cranking and firing all cylinders, it comes back to energy. It's going to pull resources away from everything else. And remember, when the resources are low, communication within your cells, across cells, across systems, across organs, throughout your entire body, that's going to go out the window as well. And then that's when things get stuck. That's when you're someone who's had this issue for 5, 10, 15 years, and this is just how you are. Because everything is being diverted to whatever is going on with the limbic system, and also trying to go to the immune system, but being a wasted effort because it's not able to really fully fight it off here. And then that's when things continue to have that budget sort of shutdown. Because, you know, remember what we were talking about before. Try to live off like $500 a month there. Now, when your limbic system is in overdrive, now you're down to like 100 bucks a month. That's a lot of ramen noodle. And so that's what's going on inside of your body. It's taking away these essential functions. This is when you now have a hormonal issue. This is now when weight gain goes into overdrive. It's not by chance. You're not unlucky here to have all these different health conditions. It all comes from the fundamental deficit in your body's energy budget. And so to wrap up that point there, so really, again, your body was already at that precipice, that cliff of going over, and the virus just you know, taking over is just another symptom. Because the immune system isn't functioning as it should, the nervous system is going into overdrive, and now energy is being depleted even 
further in an already energy depleted state. And so that's why you need to be able to really focus in on and recognize kind of what the fundamental shifts, because once we know, okay, those are the problems, how do we need to then sort of tackle these issues? That's what we're going to talk about here. All right, so with this, we need to kind of all huddle around here, around the fundamental truth here. And so this is the key to restoring your energy. With a history of EBV, and many other viruses fit into this, paging, COVID, long haulers, paging, COVID, long haulers, you need to be able to reset your nervous system and the immune system while being able to boost up and repair your body's energy system. There you go. Because when you're just like focusing on diet, but again, your limbic system's firing all cylinders, you're not going to be able to fully really get there because you're having this massive drain on your energy system. And eventually the rate at which your body is taking energy and kind of wasting it will always exceed the amount your body can take food in and actually process it. And if it's not processing it, that's when it's going to store it. That's when you're going to get overweight. That's when you're going to get metabolic issues now. Diabetes, even, you know, plaques building up in your arteries, eventually a heart attack there. That's that cardiometabolic picture that will start to develop because of these underlying issues that start here. And I, I am not saying it's all in your head because obviously there's a lot of physiological parameters, but a part of it is. Undeniably so. That being said, I wish you could just sit there and say, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I'm healthy. I'm healthy. I'm healthy. I wish that worked, but it doesn't. Um, it may work for some. It may crash most. But that's why you need to be able to really understand, okay, fundamentally, let's not even talk about like mind, bio stuff. Let's just talk electricity here. Because when one of your circuits is overactivated, it's going to prevent the other circuits from being on board. That's why your sleep is falling apart. That's why you're having the mood swings. That's why you're having the irritability. That's why you're going to depression because all those other areas, the energy is being shunted to your limbic system. And of course, yeah, the limbic system is also going to favor those really crappy mood states and really bad sleep. But again, it's something no diet is going to be able to really powerfully modify. So you need to be able to really calm down the electrical activity in there. Okay, that's one of the components. And these are all necessary, but one by themselves is never alone sufficient. That's another key point. Other parts of this. Now, okay, you're wasting less energy. Now you need to be able to get your immune system to a point of say, hey, we have a little bit more here, but we don't have enough to, you know, because you're kind of going about this very inefficiently. Sorry, immune system. Sorry, T cell. Sorry, Mr. T. Sorry, Miss B. But we need you to really be efficient with this energy. Can you do that? And so, yeah, that's what you need to have be done, because not only do you need the, the, the budgetary constraints, those need to be lifted on the immune system, but your immune system needs to be like the A-team here, all right? And that is a movie with Mr. T. Go ahead and watch it. But essentially, it needs to be able to coordinate in a way where communication is highly efficient, such that it's able to, you know, not need as much energy. And this is being able to, again, be able to really coordinate all the systems in your body. So the immune system is able to coordinate and be able to, okay, get sort of the necessary precursors to do certain things to viral particles and being able to be in a way where it's able to clear those things. It needs to be able to do all this in order. And a lot of that is being able to resynchronize the processes in your body, okay? And especially with the immune system there because if it's just kind of flailing about, it's never gonna be able to get the job done because you could calm your limbic system down all ding dong day here, but if you're not, also able to use that energy and direct it, then you're not going to be able to actually shift those things. And then the, the last big piece here is the energy system itself. Because yes, you need to decrease the drain, you need to be able to increase and improve the utilization of the energy, but you also need to be able to undo the damage that led to EBV taking over, and also undo the additional damage that was done on top. And that is really focusing in on those engines, those mitochondria, those pathways outside of the mitochondria and all the other ways that your body is able to get energy, either biochemically, photonically, um, pressure waves, all of this fun stuff. 
that happens inside of each and every one of your cells, being able to see, okay, what is going on here? What can I improve? What's going on with my glycolysis? What's going on with, you know, fatty acid oxidation outside of the mitochondria? Being able to really get a good feeling on all of these things, not based on lab testing, don't do that, but based on how you're functioning. Because it's just like a car here. When your engine is making a certain sound, when it's kind of starting and going, or maybe when it's just like it doesn't even turn on, those all tell us different diagnostic things about what's going on under the hood. Same exact thing for you, okay? And I get it. Oh, everyone else gets testing, everyone. But here's the thing. Yes, numbers tell you something, but just because they count doesn't mean you should count them, okay? And yes, I understand and appreciate. There's no guesswork, so let's do lab work. But when you don't, when you see the system just as a folate level, a B12 level, oh, your progesterone is low. If you just see it as numbers that meant to be in sort of this middle range, so you don't get an H or an L on your lab report for high or low, that's like someone hearing an engine going, <laughs> and then looking at the dashboard, be like, okay, what's going on here? What's going on here? But when you really can be a mechanic, of a car, the human body, you know what each sort of change in function really means. And you don't need to go down the rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole because you're really familiar with how that energy system works and how it's falling apart and how to bring it back together. And that's why kind of the sort of main thing here, it's just, you know, with Epstein-Barr virus, even COVID long hauler and other viral things that can be going on. And to an extent, when you have a bacterial infection that started, a lot of these viruses then become opportunistic and then you go down the same path. That's why so many people have co-infections, but it's the same process. Limbic system, chill out, immune system, relax, do your job more efficiently and be able to get your energy systems back online at a way of where they're functioning at their fullest. And that is, you know, the sort of the main thing that you need to focus in on when you're, you know, doing your research, when you're thinking about what you're already doing right now when you're talking with other people. But the, the thing is, these are a lot of things that will continue to get addressed improperly here. They'll continue to be in a big space where it's like, okay, your immune system's out of whack. Well, let's put you on these, you know, amino modulators. Oh, let's put you, uh, there's this really good supplement. It's TH, you know, whatever support, and that's going to really help. Or probiotics, because your immune system's in your gut. Those are all very similar to being able to, you know, ask someone to help you get walking again, and they just hand you a pair of crutches. Yeah, you'll be able to function somewhat, but it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be sustainable, and it's going to be something where you're not able to do the things that would be beyond that. Okay, for the person on crutches, you're not going to be able to go hiking with your friends. For the person with all these gut issues and immune system issues, and you're taking supplements, you're not going to be able to go out at a restaurant. You're not going to be able to just have that flexibility of where you can really free up what you're able to include in your diet. So that's because you're not able to fundamentally address the issues, again, just at the symptom level. Because when you go to, you know, practitioner who's like, okay, mind body, we're going to tackle this limb limbic system issue. Yeah. They can get those symptoms taken care of but it's not going to be deep enough and cohesively enough because even with the limbic system, there's the psychology piece and the physiology piece that you need to address together. And if you don't, you might as well not have addressed it. All right. It's like, again, if you're trying to fix an issue, it's just like putting duct tape on it and just ignoring kind of that other kind of leaking part over there. That's what you want to avoid. And so that's why, you know, what, I want to offer you guys is an opportunity to be able to break out of the paradigm to break through all of that and that's why we have our free breakthrough calls where we do just that we really see what those core issues are for you and being able to help you powerfully address it what's really going on what does it look like exactly at this time being able to really see how your engines are going you know those sorts of things in being able to finally recognize okay these are the issues. This is the severity of it. This is really the core truth of the problem here and what it really means for you as well, because your health never exists in a vacuum. It exists within the context of your life.
And if you don't consider that, you're never going to be able to fix it either. Because that's what really allows you to then see, okay, what can be done about this? What are the most powerful things that need to happen for you? And of course, you know, what are those goals for you? Because health is fun. Yeah, sleep is cool, right? You know, everybody wants a 97 readiness score on their sleep tracker. I don't like sleep trackers. Um, just wanted to say that. But, you know, if you could get away with one hour of sleep and you, it didn't affect your health, it didn't affect how you're able to show up at work, it didn't show up how you showed up with your family, it didn't, it didn't affect anything, everyone would go for one hour of sleep. That's just a fact. But the thing is, those sleep depriving yourself to that extent would completely wreck your life. Same thing for being able to have energy all day. You know, if you could do enjoyable things, but you were exhausted all the time, you're probably fine with being exhausted. But that's not really what we're all meant to be on this planet for and living this life for. It's being able to have the fun, have the joy, being able to have the energy to be going through life in a way of where you're kicking butt, taking names, chewing bubble gum, and you're all out of bubble gum. And being able to finally enjoy everything. And that's what it's really all about, being able to break out of the rut that you're in, the massive slump, and being able to get on to the next stage of your life. And that's what this breakthrough session is about, being able to see what it's really about, where you really want to go, and how to get there. Because if we know we can help, we will absolutely show you what that looks like, we'll walk you through that process. But first, we have to know, what's this problem look like for you? What are your goals? Are you the kind of person who can make that journey? Do we like each other? It's kind of like a first date, in a way. And being able to say, okay, well, Here's what we can do. Here's what we can do together. Here are the options and be able to really see, okay, let's get you through the EBV. Let's get you through this COVID long haul crap so you're not a, another number. Let's get you out of here so you're not stuck in the paradigm. You're not stuck with all the functional medicine people and you'll be able to finally see just how simple your health can be and be able to move on to that life of where every single day is just bonkers, you know, ghostbusters, all that fun stuff. <laughs> and what I really mean by that is being able to, I mean, just wake up and feel refreshed in a way of where you're excited for the day ahead, see it as an opportunity and be able to be excited for when you get home because you know that's another area of your life that you can now expand into on the weekends, vacation, that all becomes available for you. Because what health is at the end of the day, it's freedom for yourself, freedom for your family, being able to really be in those moments, be fully engaged and create those memories of where you're able to not only live in the moment, but be able to know that you're living the best life possible that's the most fulfilling for you. And that's why we do these breakthrough calls. And so go ahead, go to the link, optimalcircadianhealth.com forward slash talk, pick a time, and we will chat with you for 45, 60 minutes, and we'll do just everything that we mentioned. All right? But this is not for everyone. This is only for people who, I mean, exactly as I described. You look around your life and you're just like, this is just not cool. This is not acceptable. And I want to change. And I get that a lot of times people will go through this for 5, 10, 15 years. And one of the easiest roads out of the suffering is acceptance. Because very few things work from a medical health perspective. And then that's where you fall into a prison that you don't even know that you're in. A prison of where you resign to mediocrity, you accept lower standards. Because no one's been able to give you the framework that allows you to have a vision that you know you can truthfully and honestly see yourself living. And that's really the glory on these breakthrough calls. So if you're someone who's been struggling and really working to break free, then let's break through with the breakthrough call. But if you're someone who, I mean, really, truly accepts where you are, and even if that's you right now, and you can have that honest conversation with yourself, am I ready for a different life? Who would I be without this? What would I do then? Is this something I really want? Do I want to break out of the habits? Do I want to break out of the familiar space that I'm living my life right now? And if the answer is yes, go ahead, book your free breakthrough call, and we'll see you on the calendar.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. So make sure you go ahead and grab your call, your free breakthrough session there, and we'll see you there. Thanks.